All right, so welcome everyone. Um, if you haven't already, uh, please visit this website and uh, open up the Google Collab notebooks that we're going to be working through. Um, and just to kind of explain what we're trying to learn, uh, in addition to what Nikolai has said, uh, machine learning is all about modeling real world data in terms of functions. Um, and these functions are mathematical functions. So we have to find a way to relate the data to math. Um, so basically, you can think of it as we're trying to find a relationship y equals f of x, where y is what we're trying to predict, x is our given inputs, and f is uh, basically all the machine learning that we can do. Um, and so there's a lot of ways to um, start proposing models for f, um, but to get there, we need to do some programming. So if you have open up this notebook, uh, we'll get started with some Python and uh, just learn some basics of programming. OK, so in Google Colab, you can uh, connect to basically a cloud server or cloud uh, workstation. And this does the, all the computing for you, so you don't have to worry about setting anything up. So let's go and execute the very first cell here, uh, print hello world. And this is like the prototypical example in, in programming, uh, trying to get something to display. Um, and you can see that um, in Python, so print is a function, and it takes uh, a, a value of hello world, which is a string, and it prints it out to the console. And anything following a pound sign, a, a hashtag symbol, is a comment. And so this is not executed uh, in Python. Um, and the first thing you, you should understand is what is a variable. Uh, a variable is a handle on the data that we can uh, pass around in Python. So this makes it easy to pass around uh, objects like strings. So for example, here we're assigning the string hello world to A, and then we're printing A. Um, so Python in general, it, it's called a high level language because it, it doesn't require that much setup on the part of the programmer, uh, unlike other languages like C and C++. Um, and this is really useful for machine learning because we, we, we don't really care about the efficiency of uh, things like printing statements, uh, printing strings, or printing integers, or anything like that. We're interested in uh, defining these big functions that take our inputs into our uh, outputs. So the first thing we're going to talk about is functions. Um, and so a function is structured like this statement right here. So you define the function, which is uh, given the name add. And it takes two arguments, which are variables, A and B. And what it does is it takes those two variables, computes some result, and then returns that result. So you need all of these components to define a function in Python. There's also uh, there's a shorthand for this uh, where you can define it in terms of this keyword lambda. Um, and this is kind of, I think there's something similar in MATLAB with anonymous functions. Most languages have this kind of shorthand. Um, so you can see that, so we've defined add a, b, and we've just defined it with the addition operator, so this uh, symbol. And you can actually test this out on a bunch of inputs here. So first line here is we're just adding two integers, two whole numbers, one and two, and that gives us three. Here we're adding an integer and what's called a floating point number. So all your decimal or fractional numbers are represented by floating point numbers. Uh, I mentioned strings earlier, like hello world. So these are just strings of characters, lists of characters. Uh, so you can add two characters and get the string AB. And then you can add other things like lists. Um, so here's a list of the numbers one and three with a list of uh, just one element, two. And if you add these two lists, then you get one, three, two. So just in the order that they come. So you can, you can run that cell. Oh, sorry. You have to run this cell as well. Okay. 
OK, so the first exercise, pretend this is in here. <laughs> so yeah, the, the first exercise was just having you to replace um, a times b over c right here, just to get used to this kind of syntax. So you can see that we've defined a new function here, div on a, b, and c. So instead of two arguments, we're taking three arguments, and we simply paste this in. So copy and paste. Oh, and if you want, you can save a copy of all the notebooks in your drive. So that's, that's what that was. Okay. Um, and so we've mentioned a few types of data that we can have or that we can represent in the computer. Um, we have integers, which are whole numbers in a specific range. We have floating point numbers, which represent decimals. We have lists, which can contain other objects. We have dictionaries, um, and we'll, we'll go through all of these in detail uh, in, in a little bit. Um, we have all of these data types um, for collections of objects. So a list, a dictionary, a tuple. So all of these are for organizing data into collections. Uh, there's the strings that we saw earlier. There's also Booleans, which are, uh, they take on the value true or false. And this kind of maps nicely into computer science because uh, everything in a computer is a zero or one. Um, so true or false, one or zero. And then there's also a set, uh, which is another type of collection. OK, so the second exercise, using the type function, so there's a function named type that's built in. Um, replace here uh, with any of these variables and to, to find out what the type is. So before you do that, what would you expect the type of A to be based on this list up here? So please, please anyone answer? Right, so this is an integer. And how can we tell that apart from C? So what, what, what type is C here? You can see I've placed the decimal point, right? Right, so this is a float or a floating point number. Um, so these two are integers. This is a float, and you, you can check that with print type C. Oh, sorry. You have to run the cell first. And you can see it's a float. And then D, uh, this looks like a list, right? Uh, we, we defined a list earlier. Um, this, what, what about E? What is the type of E? Right, it's also a list. But in comparison to D, it contains objects that have different types. So this might be a little different from some other programming languages. Um, your lists in Python can contain whatever type you want. And then F is an example of a dictionary, and we'll, we'll go through this more later. But to give you a preview, uh, a dictionary is kind of like a list, where instead of uh, addressing each of the elements by a number, you address them by some key. So in this case, the keys we're using are A and B. And we can get the values associated with that key out of this dictionary. So we'll, we'll talk about this in a little bit. Um, so even objects like lists, uh, so yeah, uh, all objects in Python have what are called methods associated with them. So these are functions that you call using that object. They're associated with that object. So for example, the type uh, list here, we defined E as a list. Um, has this function append. So when we call append onto another object, uh, so e.append on that object, then you can see before we append, well, we have the list as we defined up here. And after we append, we've added on a single element onto the end. And what's kind of weird about Python is even numbers have um, methods, and that's because numbers are objects in, in Python. So you can see this number, well, this has a method or a um, field called real, 
and this returns the real part of one. If I, so to represent a, a complex number, um, you, uh, instead of i, you write j. Uh, and again, you get the real part of this complex floating number. All right. Uh, there's other convenience functions in Python. For example, converting a string into an int and uh, going back, going the other direction. So you can see in both these cases, um, we're taking a string and converting it to an int, taking an int and converting it into a string. And as I alluded to earlier, even functions are objects in Python. So if you check the type of print, it's an object of the type built-in function or method. And you can actually just find all of the associated methods to a, an object or a function by calling dir on the object. So you can see print has all of these uh, functions or methods associated with it. Okay, any, any questions so far? All right, so now we'll move on to conditional statements. And this is how we control what the computer does um, automatically without having to uh, write out the code every single time. So there's these data type called uh, Boolean variables, which I mentioned earlier. Uh, it can take on true or false. And if statements let us print or let us execute all statements after this if statement, if um, what it operates on is true. So if I just give it the value true, it's going to print out true. If I give it the value false, it's not going to print out anything. Um, so in addition to just providing these values true and false, we can perform comparisons. Um, so for example, the operator greater than takes two numbers, uh, so a and a second number, and it decides if it's uh, true or false. Is this statement true or false? A is greater than zero. So since we assigned A equals zero here, A is not greater than zero, so we get false. So then we can place this uh, conditional statement uh, into the if clause. So if A is greater than zero, then print greater than zero. Uh, since A is not greater than zero, we go to else. So here we've printed less than or equal to zero. Okay, so there's a, a lot of different operators in Python that perform comparisons. Um, there's this double equal sign, which tests for if the left side is equal to the second, uh, right side. This is different from just the single equals, which remember is just variable assignment. Um, there's this uh, exclamation point equals, which means not equals. So this is true if one is not equal to two. So you can see here is true. Greater than equals, less than equals. Uh, kind of uh, these these comparison operators do what you expect. There's also uh, other Boolean operators. Uh, so this or and and not, they take Boolean values and give you another Boolean value. So the or is the non-exclusive or. So either one is greater than two or greater or two is greater than one or both. So we're allowing both of them to be true. Uh, you would get true. So you can see for is true. And is kind of the opposite of or uh, in terms of um, you need both of these uh, to be true in order to return true, otherwise you get false. The not uh, just takes the opposite of your Boolean value, so one greater than two is false, so not of that is true, and then true and true is true. And these comparison operators, some of them work on uh, other types of objects other than just numbers, so for example, string one is equal to string one. All right, so any questions about Boolean uh, variables or conditional statements? All right. 
So the advantage of programming is that we can get the computer to do uh, a lot of tedious operations automatically uh, so that you don't have to do them. So for loops are a, a way to make this happen. So let's say that there's a list of numbers that we want to sum, uh, one through six. Um, and we're going to go through the list and find the sum by adding each of these numbers to a, a total, which we'll call answer. So the statement in Python is for each i in list to sum. So what this does is it takes each of these elements of the list and assigns it to i. Uh, we're going to perform this statement, uh, answer plus equals i. So what this does is this is the equivalent of answer equals answer plus i. It's a short shorthand for this. So going through each of these elements one at a time, um, answer is initially 0. We take the first element of the list, 1, and we add it to our answer. So we get 1 after this loops through one time. And then i gets assigned to the next number, 2. And again, we add it to answer. So we'll get 1, 3, 6, 10, 15, 21. And in the end, our answer is just the, the final answer, 21. Does that make sense? All right. So this is the first actual exercise I'll have you do. Um, if, you, if there's someone sitting next to you, feel free to collaborate. How do I find the product of the list instead of just the sum? So I'll, I'll give you maybe two minutes to think about this and we'll go over the answer. OK. So what should my first line here be? What should I write here for the initial value of answer 1? Right. And you can think of it because um, if you have an empty list, well, you can kind of choose any answer you want. But if you have a list of one element, you want the product to just be that element. right? So the, the number that you multiply to get itself is 1. And then in this for loop, uh, what am I going to write here? Right. Answer times equals i. OK. So everyone kind of understand that? Um, this is, again, shorthand for answer equals answer times i. OK. And then you can combine for loops with conditional statements and break out of the for loop early. So in this case, um, let's say, this is initially here, sorry. OK. So let, let's think about what this would do. So this list is, again, uh, 1 to 6. And we're iterating over it. And apparently, we're adding all the numbers together until we reach uh, what's the first value of i that this is true? It's 4, right? Because 4 is greater than 3. So at that point, we actually execute this statement, break which tells us to break out of this for loop. 
So that's why here, instead of 21, uh, which is the sum from 1 to 6, what do we get here? We get the sum from 1 to 3. So 1 plus 2 plus 3 is 6. And so this is useful if you have some kind of condition that you want to satisfy. And you're, you, you, uh, that's when you want the answer to basically um, be returned. OK, so what happens if I move this line down here after the if statement? You can, uh, you can run this. Uh, and you can see we got, sorry. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So before we had 10, because we actually summed all the way to 4, because we were performing this answer plus equals. Uh, let, let me show you here. Before, when answer plus equals i was up here, when i was 4, we still added it to the answer. We broke out of the for loop after we added it to the answer. So 4 was still part of the sum. But if we move it down here, uh, before we get a chance to add it to the sum, we've already broken out of the for loop. So we get 6 instead. OK. So these two. So the, the data type list, along with for loops, are technically enough to do basically anything you want in Python. Um, so we'll talk about lists next. So we've already seen that you can write a list just in terms of these square brackets, separated by commas. There's also a list function, which takes uh, this function, um, range 1 to 6. Um, and range 1 to 6 is what's called a generator. It, it's not important what that means. But basically, you can think of it as uh, this is telling you to iterate from 1 to 6, um, not including 6. So that's why you get here 1 to 5. So this list takes a generator and creates a list out of it. If you don't specify the first argument, so if you call range with only one argument here, 6, it actually starts at 0. So you still get 6 elements, um, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. You just don't include 6. And then there's also uh, this notation. If you pass three arguments to range, so what, what does this do? It starts at 1. It goes up to not including 10. And it uh, goes in steps of 3. So we go from 1. Uh, add 3 to that is 4, add 3 to that 7, add 3 to that is 10, but 10 is not included. So that's what this statement does. OK, so I, I kind of answered what um, these different versions of the function do. And so now that we've stored objects into a list to get them back out, uh, you index them. So you index them with an integer. And so the indexing, just like for range, starts at 0. So this first element is actually the 0th element of the list. So L of 3, or the third element, third indexed element of L, is 0, 1, 2, 3. So L, L3 is 4. So unlike uh, MATLAB and Julia and a few other languages, we don't start at 1. We start at 0. Okay. And I, I mentioned that for loops and lists are really convenient um, for iterating through things, uh, doing a lot of things. Um, so that uh, you automatically, so that you don't have to do it by hand. This list comprehension is a way to combine the two. So we saw we can take 
um, a generator like range and make a list out of it. So in this case, we're taking a generator. Um, this entire expression is a generator. And what it's saying is create this list. So you need the brackets here, square brackets, such that uh, for all of the elements in this range, so 0 through 9, return this number, 2 times that number. So what we see here is the number 0 through 9 times 2. Right, so 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, all the way to 18. So this is just a compact way of saying, for each of these elements, append it to an empty list. So here's an exercise. I want you to modify this uh, function, which has a list comprehension in it, to give me the remainder of all of these integers uh, after dividing by b. And the remainder operator is written a percent sign b. So take a minute to uh, think about how you would modify this return statement. Okay, does anyone have a suggestion for how we solve this problem? So remember that uh, this list comprehension means that we're going to perform this operation before the for statement for each value of i in the list. So to find the remainder of each element, what, what are we going to do? We have a list of integers, and we want to take the remainder with respect to b. So right here, we would write percent sign b. So if it's helpful, you can put parentheses around this kind of to indicate, OK, so for each element i in the list, we're going to compute the remainder here. And that's, that's going to be for all of the uh, integers i in the list so that we get this new list. So does this make sense if we take the remainder of each of the numbers from 0 to 9 with respect to 4? You can see 0 divided by 4 has a remainder of 0, uh, 1, 2, 3, and then you see we repeat again. So 4 is divisible by 4, and so is 8. OK. Anyone confused? This makes sense. So working with dictionaries, I, I mentioned earlier that dictionaries are very similar to lists. Uh, instead of the square brackets, you use these curly braces. And uh, the difference is, before we could index into the list with an integer. Here, for dictionaries, you can index into them with uh, almost any object. So for example, a string here. So if we write this statement, we're saying that let's assign a value of first element. Remember, this is the assignment operator. First element 
to the key A. So this means dictionary has lists of values here, which we're assigning to the dictionary, and then the key that you use to access that value. Um, so here I've uh, filled up this dictionary with a few other entries. Um, this is called a tuple, which we'll also go over later, and it's basically just um, an ordered pair of a and four. So this means we're assigning a value of this, 375763, to the entry of dictionary which has key A4. And we can assign other objects like lists. Here is a list of strings. It's a list of strings. And we're assigning it to uh, the key in the dictionary, the value of five. And when you look at what the dictionary actually contains, it, it looks like this. So you have the curly braces on the outside. Each of the key value pairs is separated by a comma. And then the key is to the left of the colon, and then the value is to the right of the colon. And uh, you can actually create a dictionary just using this. So if I copy and paste it here, um, dictionary two is the same as um, dictionary with these keys and values. And so dictionaries, uh, like lists, had append as a function. Uh, dictionaries have these uh, functions, keys and values. And these return um, iterators over the keys and the values. So what, what that means is that we can use these just like we used range. We can use them in a for loop. So for each key in dictionary.keys, we can perform some operation. Same with the values. Um, and this is what you, you see when you print it out. Um, it, it, it kind of look like, it looks like a list. OK. So talking about tuples, tuples are ordered pairs or higher number of objects. Um, so for example, tuple, this tuple is the tuple 1, 2. You can think of it maybe as a coordinate. Uh, in the xy plane. You can use, um, just like lists, you can use objects of different types. So here we have a tuple of a string, an int, and uh, a list. And the advantage of tuples, or differences of tuples with versus lists, um, first, you can't change the length of a tuple. In fact, you can't change the elements of a tuple at all. And that's why you can actually use them as keys in dictionaries. Um, lists you cannot use as a key in a dictionary. Um, so tuples are what are called immutable. You can't change them. And they provide an easy way to iterate over uh, generators of tuples or lists of tuples. So, Dictionary additionally has this additional uh, method called items, which iterates over the key value pairs simultaneously. So you can see in this for loop, uh, for each key value pair in the dictionary, we're assigning the value of the key to this variable key and the value to the variable value. And so in this for loop, we're gonna print out the key value pair. And you can see, for example, the key was A and the value was first element, or the key was this tuple, uh, value was this integer, key was this integer, value was this list. And so this kind of expression is equivalent to, um, or, or rather you can make uh, generators of tuples using the function zip. So instead of writing dot items, we could have written zip uh, dictionary dot keys, dictionary dot values. And this accomplishes the same thing. All right, we're going to skip over this and go straight to our first exercise. 
Um, so there's this list of uh, simple mathematical exercises that are difficult to do by hand, but really easy to do through programming uh, called Project Euler. And so we've talked about list comprehensions. Um, there's this uh, concept of a filtered list comprehension. So um, here in this list comprehension, you can see we just have the number i for i in this range, so 0 through 9. But only if the remainder, when we divide by 2, is 0. So we filtered out all the elements where this statement is not true. So if we print just the normal list comprehension up here, we get 0 through 9. But once we filtered out all of the integers, which uh, are odd, basically, we get a shorter list. So I want you to use uh, this filtered list comprehension idea to find the sum of all the integers from 0 to 999 inclusive, which are divisible by 3 or divisible by 5. So that's the problem statement. So I'll let you have a minute to answer this question. And this is the answer you should be getting, 233168. So you can check if your solution is correct. So the way I like to break this problem down, uh, first, what is the generator, or what, what is the range I'm iterating over? So what, what should come after the for statement? Any suggestions? in range, uh, in this case, a 1,000, right? We're going to 999. So for range in 1,000, for i in range in 1,000, uh, you, you can use a different variable here if you want. So well, ultimately, we're going to want the number itself, but only if it satisfies this statement, divisible by 3 or divisible by 5. So modeling this on this filtered list comprehension up here, oops, right. So we're testing each of these numbers from 0 to 1,000 if they're divisible by 3 or 5. And we're filtering out the ones that don't satisfy this condition. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I, I didn't. Uh, I did not introduce this function sum. Um, this takes a list or generator and just returns the sum, so that you don't have to write out the code every single time. So, right, we get the same answer. All right. I think we'll take a short five-minute break here. 
Um, if you have questions, please come up and ask.